Hi guys, this is Dave from Dave's Vintage Apple Tech, and you know this has been a very long journey with this G4 Cube. And my journey started February 25th actually of 2020. That's when I unboxed this Cube. And it has certainly evolved as far as the upgrades that I've put into it. And I made several videos of these upgrades. You can look in my playlist on the Cube and you can see every single one. But we put a SSD drive in it, a crucial drive. Then we put a fan in it. And then we put a Apple upgraded video card in it. And we upgraded the RAM memory in it. We used a IDE to SATA adapter so we could hook up the modern SSD drive to the cube. And we also got an adapter so we could get some audio out on this cube. And then from there, we did other upgrades to go over the original upgrades that we did was a 600 megahertz CPU AGP board that went in it and that was modified and that really boosted the speed up on this cube. And then we actually got a hold of the actual USB powered speakers for the cube that has the amplifier on it and that's how we enabled the bong on it because that's the only way you can get these things to chime. You have to have the original Apple Pro speakers with the USB amplifier attached to the cabling. And then I was fortunate enough to find brand new, new old stock of the Apple Pro speakers, new in the box, never been used, to replace the old original speakers. So we did a transplant on that and again we have a video on that and these things sound fantastic. And then with the old original speakers that were removed from these, we reconed them. I did a video on that and we actually put these in the original G4 Cube enclosures and they sound great too. I use them on my Mac Pro. And then we replaced the video card in this again we replaced it with an NVIDIA GeForce 6200 256 megabyte AGP video card that was actually flashed, intentionally made for a PC. And I'll tell you what, the graphics on this thing just absolutely are just amazing. What a difference in horsepower on that thing that that makes. So you can play games at full resolution on this thing back in the day that were made for the older G4 machines and G5 machines works no problem. And we also did a follow-up video on that graphics card. We had to modify the back plate on it because it was kind of loose so we kind of re-engineered the original back plate and now it's in there all nice and tight. Works fine. No worry about the cables ever coming loose in it. So that was a good fix. And then the next upgrade we were going to do was putting the Sonnet 1.6 gigahertz processor board in it, but unfortunately that didn't work out because we could never upgrade the firmware with that Sonnet firmware on this machine. That was real disappointing because that would have been fantastic. However, I did get a 1.4 gigahertz Sonnet processor board for this, and wow, what a difference it made on that too. It really works fantastic. And then we put a CNC autonomous fan controller in this cube so that way it will automatically regulate the speed when the cube gets hot. And with the fan installed previously, it does not have a temperature control on it. So we had it running off the 5 volt. And although it kept a good job of keeping it cool, we could not get the full potential. So when we got the CNC fan controller, we were able to run it off the 12 volt circuit. Because that is a 12 volt fan that was already in it. And it works fantastic. But this cube runs really cool. That fan hardly ever ramps up, even when I'm doing extensive things on it. Rendering video, playing a game. It doesn't really ramp up hardly at all, which is great because this thing runs really cool. And of course, our next upgrade was to the power supply itself, which was very simple. By just putting these tiny little rubber feet on the bottom of it to elevate it off. And that allows it to get a lot better airflow. And it definitely helps keeping this power supply a lot cooler. And that's a nice, simple, inexpensive upgrade to do on your power supplies on these particular machines because these things get very, very hot. 
but when you elevate it off the ground like that, this is off probably about three-eighths of an inch, it keeps it nice and cool. And then of course I've done several videos on some of the things that we've done like we did a thing for the Mac Yak Power PC 68K challenge when I produced a iMovie on this thing using uh, iMovie HD and that was the last version you could run on this computer. I did find a hack to get a newer version of iMovie on it which is iMovie 9 and that allows me to get full 1080 resolution out of the cube. And then we did some other things by installing certain software to get on YouTube like 104 Fox, 104 Tube. We put iLife on it. We have the whole iLife suite on it, GarageBand and all that kind of stuff. Makes it a lot more usable. But the problem that we have with the Cube, we need to do some maintenance on it. And that is, is the optical drive in this works absolutely fine. But with these older machines, they suffer from the eject belt getting very loose and very sloppy or even breaking. So when the disc comes out, a lot of times you would actually have to lay the cube on its side for the disc to come out or sometimes they won't come out at all. So I have here a bunch of assorted drive belts and what we're going to do is we're going to put a new drive belt on this cube. We're going to take the drive out of it, dismantle it, blow it all out and put this drive belt. Now I got a lot of assorted belts here. I'm not sure what is the right size but this is for various CD, ROM drives for computers, for the machines, VCRs, cassette recorders. So we have a variety of belts here. So hopefully we have one that will be fitting close enough. So that's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this out into the garage. We're going to take it apart and I'm going to show you how to change the drive belt in this machine. And of course, one of the great things also is I did a video on how to light up the Apple logo. And then I did another video of how to tone it down a little bit. But that was fantastic. I wish these machines had the logo already lit up in it. I think that would have been a very easy thing for Apple to do back in the day. But it is what it is, so that's why we do things like this ourselves. And that really makes it look very nice. And you can even put RGB lighting in this thing too. And I'll put a link for Action Retro. Sean there at Action Retro, he has an awesome channel. He does some really cool stuff. And he has really modified his cube too. We have kind of like a little ongoing unofficial competition with our cubes. Um, I've got some other things in the works for this. If you want to watch his videos on his cube, all the things that he's done on that, watch it. I'll put a link in here for that. And also Mike from Mike's Mac Shack. I graciously sent him the 600 megahertz board for his cube to give it a new lease on life and you can watch his video on that. I'll put a link in there too in the description for his channel. Okay so we got the cube out here in the uh, garage here and we've got the case off of it and you can see right here this is the optical drive. Now I don't have the little plate that normally slips in there. That's been removed but you can see here's the RAM, there's the side of the optical drive, there's the SSD in there, the autonomous fan controllers up in there, and you have the uh, better shot of the RAM memory there, there's the uh, NVIDIA upgraded card, and this is not passively cooled, this actually has a little fan built on it, and that's the the VRM board, which I ordered one from Japan all the way back from October, and that has never ever showed up. So I don't know if it's ever going to show up, but I did request a refund. I did get a refund on it, and I'm just kind of waiting to see if that thing magically shows up. I've kind of given up all hope on it, but hopefully it'll show up because I'd like to have that board replaced, and that way it'll have a lot more amperage to it for any more future upgrades that we're going to do. And of course this is the airport card there. So yeah, so what we're going to do is this is held in by four screws. Once we take the screws out of it, then this simply just slides out after we unhook the cable on it, obviously, the ribbon, the uh, IDE cable on it. But what we have to do is we'll take this plate off first and that will give us ingress to this here. Okay, so then once you get the um, Molex connector off of it and the ID connector, you can get the optical drive out. And 
right there is the autonomous fan controller. This is what controls the fan in the base of the cube here and the power is directly harnessed right into the Molex connector. I modified the Molex connector so the power goes right inside it. It's right on the little vampire plugs on it so it'll never come loose. And the same thing for this. I put the 5 volt side of this for the Apple logo. That's in that plug too. So if you guys want to do that yourself, that's where I got the power source from. Okay, so this is the optical drive. This is the original optical drive for this machine here. And I'll just hold this up here for you so you can see that that's it right there. And that's the model number. Now, interesting thing is I've looked up the model number on these things trying to find a cross-reference for the drive belt. And I really haven't found anything substantial uh, as far as the actual belt that goes for it. So what a lot of people do is they get an assortment of drive belts like I did. And you get, when you pull the old belt out, uh, there's a way to measure them. And I'll show you how to do that. But you can see this was manufactured in June of 2000. I'll try to get this right up there for you there. June of 2000 there. So it works just fine though. It's a great little drive. And the reason why I'm keeping the optical drive is it just serves as a nice way to bridge software. So when you have a newer machine, older machine, like the G4s and in your modern Macs, it's a nice way to bridge software. So if the only media source that you have is on the original CD or CD-ROM or DVD-ROM, you can put it in the original drive, even though it's a lot slower. And that's one way of doing it, especially if you have a an older Mac that doesn't have a USB port on it. Now I've never taken one of these particular drives apart so we're gonna learn it together here. So what we gotta do is we gotta take this board off the back here and it's held on by two screws so we're gonna take that off. Alright and so there we go that's the connector that goes into the uh, optical drive and this is the Molex connector side there. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take this apart and there's a couple screws here on the case here so we'll take those off. Okay so I took the two screws out of it here and let's lift the cover up here and we'll put that to the side there. So this is what it looks like on the inside guys right there. There's lots, there's some springs in there. And here's the, uh, there's a drive belt right there. Looks like, looks like there might be two in here. I'm not sure. Hmm, interesting. But here's one of them right here. Boy, that thing is really dry. Hopefully you can see it there. Right there, it's really, really dry. It goes around this pulley here, this pulley here. There's some, gears in there that are very yellowed but they're not broken which is good and obviously we're going to have to do a little lubricating on this although the action is very very it's not bound up or anything so that's good but yeah i think there's another belt in here if i'm not mistaken i think there's two belts in here now there's some little wheels in here too that help it come out there's the little eject motor right there so yeah, so let me uh, take this apart here. It looks like we need to take this plate off here. So there are some very, very tiny springs here. One on each side that holds that down. And there's one here. And this is a square belt. This belt is square. It's not, it's not like a regular O-ring belt. This is square. This thing has no stretch at all in it. Okay, so we got those little springs off of there. Those will be a lot of fun to put back on there. Now we need to get... Yeah, there's a roller on here. We got to... Re... Uh, yeah. That's what that belt goes to. It drives that little roller on here. Okay, there we go. Got it out of there. All right. Now this little roller 
it was all rubbery and we're going to have to clean that because that gets all gummed up they get very um what happens with the rubber it's it's still you can still feel it it's very grabby feeling still but what happens is these rollers they get what we call glazed up um, just from all the action that it sees over the years and this one although it doesn't look that bad uh, we're going to hit it with some the best thing to deglaze it with is just use some alcohol on it and a uh, either a soft cloth um, I wouldn't use a q-tip because that'll make a mess it'll it'll catch all the q-tips so I just use like a microfiber cloth or something just kind of or 100% cotton cloth that would probably work pretty good too so I'm just looking at this I'm looking at the mechanism here everything seems to move very freely um, there's no uh, broken gears that I can see which is thankful because I don't have access to a 3d printer I'm sure you could probably find replacement parts for this somebody making them up I'm just making sure that there's no other belt on this thing here that comes out of there that's the way it goes in there this is very grippy I'll clean this little rubber grommet here this is what the disc sits on that little wheel right there that's the drive motor but it looks like there's only one belt in here that I can see and that's just for the eject mechanism so it's driven by this motor right here this gear here which in turns turns this wheel here and this is what pulls the CD in and ejects it pretty simple actually but I tell you what, this thing is very clean. I mean, it looks brand new in there. It's very, I don't think it's, and who knows, it's, I don't think it's ever been apart. I will hit it just a little bit with compressed air. So let's go get the drive belts. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we have our drive belts. Now, like I said, this is the original one. There's lots of ways you can measure these, okay? Um, if you don't have the belt, these are all old school ways of doing it. It's it's really not too scientific, okay? But so say like, let's just say that our belt, look at this here. So say our belt that goes here and here, and say that was broken. Well, what you can do is you take the broken belt and whatever you feel, if you want to measure it in inches or millimeters or centimeters, you can do that. This is a uh, a, a millimeter gauge and also a regular uh, 18 inch ruler this is a, for use for uh, graphic arts so when you're laying up nigs and stuff like that you can uh, do a very precise measuring with it so but now we have actually the belt that we have it's intact now we know this is stretched out a little bit so this will give our measurement and we'll be able to work backward from it a little bit because the one we're going to replace it with going to be just a tiny bit smaller because like I said this thing has no more stretch in it it's all stretched out so we know that it's not 100% accurate so basically what you do is you can take maybe some white out so you can see it a little bit better and I'm just going to uh, make a little mark on this now this is a flat belt okay and I'm just going to mark all the way around it so I can see the marking no matter which way I'm rolling this thing all right okay so then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna use the, the millimeter gauge here and what you do get this so we can see it here and let me get this uh, a little closer to you here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our millimeters here. And let me get the mark lined up here. Start it there, there's my mark right here. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna roll this thing very carefully. Just gonna roll it all the way around here. You wanna keep it straight. I see my mark it's, we're coming up on it it's 
right there. So we're about uh, 200 millimeter. Okay. So that's the length of our belt here. That's where my mark is. Now, like I said, if you feel more comfortable in inches, you can measure it in inches. So 200 millimeter. So that's our goal. So we have all of our assorted belts in here. And you can get these pretty cheap, actually. Now, like I said, I bought a whole assorted packaging of them because I really didn't know what was what. And so here's the assorted belts here. So hopefully we have one that will work. So we're in the bag here, a whole bunch of different ones. And like I said, we want to go for one just a little bit smaller for this particular situation because this thing is really uh, kind of petrified, uh, so to speak, over the years. And so we're going to get these out. Now most of these are square belts, but there are a few of them that are round. So let me just dig through the pile here. Alright, so these are the biggest ones I could find. And as you can see, here's the original ones out here. This is the newer one. Now the original one seems to be a little bit thicker than the uh, this one here, but I think probably this one here on the inside where my fingers are here, I think that was probably the actual size of it because like I said, this belt's really stretched. It doesn't even stretch anymore. So that's what we're going to go with. Now, like I said, these are going to go on the wheels here. But before we do that, I'm even thinking of almost maybe putting two of these on, but I think that might cause some problems. So we're just going to go with the one and hopefully that uh, tracks okay. We will find out. Worst case scenario, I just now that I got the belt, maybe I can find one. I have the model number on it, so maybe I can track it down. But anyway, we're going to go with this here. But what we're going to do first, though, is we're going to clean this wheel up here. And there is a little... Let's see here. We're going to... Um, and like I said, this thing is really... I mean, it's very free and clear. It's not bound up. Um... Probably just going to use a little light oil on these. I don't, I'm not really a lover of lithium grease because lithium grease gets dried out and cracked. So I might just put a little bit of um, sewing machine oil on here. That works really good. Sewing machine oil is a very, very fine mineral based oil and it does not uh, dry out like lithium grease does. So that's generally what I do. So we'll do that. But like I said, this thing is really clean. So how I'm gonna, what I'm gonna use to clean this with is, like I said, we're gonna use some. Uh, I got some little isopropyl alcohol in a spray bottle here, and I'm gonna get. I think I'm just gonna use a microfiber cloth here. Let's move these out of the way. And like I said, this roller really is not that bad. It's not glazed up that bad at all. But this is gonna take any of that glaze off of it. This is actually. 91% isopropyl. This is stronger than the 70%. All right. Now you can look here. This is not uh, white, but there it is getting some stuff off of there because I can already feel I can already feel the difference here. The rubber's not cracked, and again we're just going to hit it again with with the alcohol here. Get it all cleaned up here. And get this out of our way here. It looks good. Yeah, that looks great. That's got that's very grabby now. Very good. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to take a Q-tip and kind of clean these uh, wheels off here. Put a little alcohol on it. Get in here and clean these little pulleys off. Okay, so now what I've done is I've actually um, taken the uh, drive motor off the uh, eject mechanism here 
and it's all all the gears look good there's a little worm gear right right there the worm gear and then you get your little other little planetary gears here so everything looks fine so what I'm gonna do is I'm just ever so lightly gonna lubricate this and what I'm gonna use is sewing machine oil and I have a little different method of putting it on there okay like I said I don't do I do not use lithium grease on this stuff I guarantee you after 15 20 years it's gonna be like concrete it will cause these little teeth to break off these get brittle kind of on their own anyway because of the type of plastic they're made out of but the less tension and friction you have on them, the longer they're going to last. And what happens with lithium grease is it gets hard and then the mechanism can't move and it gets in a bind and it breaks the gears. So to alleviate that problem, what we're going to do is we're going to use some sewing machine oil. Now you can also use, um, and I've also, this is, when I used to have jute boxes, this is exactly what I would put on the player motors. There's like little oil light bearings and you put that on there and I'll tell you what, they, they last forever, the bearings, because this actually absorbs into the metal, like if they have brass bushings, it actually absorbs in there and it constantly oils it. Where if you put lithium grease, that doesn't happen. Whenever lithium grease starts to uh, get hard over the years, all your lubrication properties. So there's a different, couple different ways. This has a little extender on it, but what we're gonna do is, I actually will use a little model paintbrush and that way I can control where I want it. The problem with that is you put a drop, it goes everywhere and we don't want that. So I'm gonna get a little paintbrush here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drill just a little bit on this piece of plastic here. You can't see it, but I'll show you here in a second here. So right there, I put a little oil right there. And I'm just gonna use my little model brush here. Get it daubed up here going to wipe some of the excess off and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to just kind of go right here because you don't need to drown the thing and again uh, just a, a little bit goes a long way I'm going to put some here put some there and this will all get circulated around once this thing is running A little oil in there. And guys, this is the way I do it. But as far as everything else, everything else looks fine in here. Everything moves freely and stuff. I just wanted to hit the gears here. So we're done putting the oil on it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, make sure that I don't have any oil. Again, I'm gonna clean these little belt pulleys here where the belt's going to lay on it. I just want to make sure there's no oil on here. That would be disastrous. And we're just going to very carefully move these so that it all sits down in there so nothing is in binding. That looks really good right there. And we're going to put the screws back in it. And we're going to put this thing back together. And when you tighten these screws, do not over tighten them because this again this plastic is very old so when you tighten these up just snug it don't crank it down just you just want to snug it to where it, it's not going to come loose you don't want to over tighten it because you will damage the plastic so this looks really good that mechanism moves freely so what we're going to do is we're going to put this dry belt on now these also have different widths and like I said this belt's a little skinnier in width but it should work all right 
Okay, so we got the G4 cube all reassembled and we are ready to see if the fruits of our labor paid off. Um, hopefully I put everything together back right on that drive. But anyway, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy actually. I didn't feel the need to tear it all the way apart because like I said, it was very, very clean on the inside. It wasn't gummy. I did blow it out with some air. And like I said, I lubricated some of the gears with a very light sewing machine oil. So that way they'll stay lubricated, they won't dry out. So we're going to power this thing up and see how it works. Okay, so we booted okay. Our autonomous fan controller just kicked on it and does that. It just, just runs at the slowest speed there. And so yeah, so our windows are up. So let's find out. If this works. So it pulls the disc in there real good. That's a good sign. And we'll let it boot up here. And then we'll eject the disc and we'll see if that works. It's reading the disc. It's an Aperture 3 install disc which won't run on this. Need a newer system. Okay. So let's hit the eject button. Nice, look at that. It comes right out of there before it would, it would go. Oh no, nice. Right, let's try that again. So we can eject it here again. Look at that guys. Perfect, excellent. So that's how you take care of the eject belt. It's not that hard to do. However, like I said, those belts are just a little undersized, but it seems to work okay. It doesn't stutter trying to come out. It pulls it right in, it ejects it right out. So that's fantastic. I am so happy about that. Very cool. So to get a close up of it here. Eject it. Look at that. Excellent. Fantastic. That is awesome. Okay, so I consider this a success. It worked out really good. So guys, that's how you take care of your eject mechanism. If you want to keep your old Macs running good and you're keeping the vintage drives, that's the way to do it. And I'm glad that I showed you guys how this worked. And it might not be the correct method, but it's the method that worked for me. Okay guys, so I hope you liked this video. Please like and subscribe and click that notification bell for the latest videos. Also, we are on MeWe and we are on Twitter. You can reach out to me on Twitter and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.